32. Brasenowick, what the hell do you think you're doing? The way is open, Captain, the rebel commander replied. We can push through to the university grounds and be trapped in a bottle. Or can't you see that approaching army from the east? Grayson didn't wait for an answer. McCall, Clay, help me hold off the Kurita Max. Lori, Dabrowski, see if you can help Brasenowick. Grayson's autocannon was delivering its rapid fire as he spoke, the shells smashing into the crusader's head and torso in a steady stream. McCall joined him, catching the enemy mech in a deadly autocannon crossfire. The range was too great for precisely aimed headshots, however, and the enemy mech too large to be felt quickly by a few lucky hits. The crusader stopped its advance, took a few steps backward under the withering fire, then straightened as though in a heavy wind and began to advance once more. Grayson saw that the enemy mechs alongside were lighter machines, a scattering of wasps, stingers and commandos, probably members of the Kurita light recon lance they'd encountered in the raid to free the Verfandian prisoners. They did not seem anxious to advance, into the sleeting fire the three great death mechs were laying down, even though most of it was concentrated on the larger crusader. We're pulling out, chief. That was Lori's voice, and a quick glance at the gateway under the university towers showed the last of the hover vehicles pulling off on sharply tilted fans, sending rooster tails of dust high into the air behind them. The ferrocrete under the gateway arch was littered with bodies, blue loyalist uniforms mingled with greens, browns and greys of the rebel troops. More blue uniforms were spilling through the gate as he watched. Lori's locust backed away, her machine guns raking the advancing mob until it wavered, broke and tumbled back in disorder. Grayson turned back to face the battle max. The crusader was much closer now, less than 200 meters. This was going to be tricky. McCall, Clay, fall back, but be ready to give me cover. The rifleman and the wolverine turned and lumbered north behind a shadow hawk. Laser bolts flashed and burned to Grayson's left. The recon max had spread out in a rough semicircle, and some of them were working their way to the north, in an attempt to cut off the Great Death's retreat. Missiles smashed into the Shadowhawk's right arm as red lights flashed across Grayson's control panel. He brought the right arm laser into line, punched the firing control, and bit back a savage curse as the weapon refused to fire. He triggered his SRM tubes instead, and watched his last two missiles arc across the narrowing range and into the crusader's chest. He looked to the north. Lori was in a close-range duel with the Stinger, and Clay and McCall were exchanging shots with the enemy Max, hidden by a patch of woods. Where was the Browski? SRMs from the crusader smashed close beside him and sent his Shadowhawk into a lumbering run. Grayson knew the slower crusader wouldn't be able to catch him from behind. That left only the light scout max to worry about. Where was the Browski? Strike Force 5, this is Strike Force leader. Where the hell are you, the Browski? There was no answer. He brought a Shadow Hawk alongside Lori's mech and joined her in blasting at the enemy stinger until the scout mech turned, fired its jump jets, and broke free. Has anyone seen the Browski's mech? Grayson asked on the open band. Did he get clear? Captain, Lori said. Look south. Grayson spun his hawk. The smoke from the burning aerospace fighter was lying low and heavy between the Grey Death Max and the University, but Grayson could see a giant figure emerge from it, reaching forward and down. The Kurita Crusader had not followed Grayson after all, but had sought out another target. 
The Brawski Stinger lay full length on the ground, some distance to the east, where Grayson had held the line with Clay and McCall. Perhaps the Stinger had gotten lost in the smoke and strayed in the wrong direction. Perhaps the Brawski had been navigating through the smoke by a compass whose reading had been jarred by weapons fire. Whatever the cause, his Stinger had taken hits that left his mech's left leg in tatters and smashed the laser mounted on its right arm. Now Dabrowski was trying to drag his helpless mech clear of the looming crusader. Even from a range of 600 meters, Grayson could see that the Stinger's radio antennae had been sheared away from its head. That explained Dabrowski's silence. The Crusader outweighed the Stinger three to one. One massive fist rose, paused, and descended. Lori gave a soft cry as the Stinger's head splintered like a crystal egg. Numb, barely able to speak, Grayson somehow managed to give the order. The surviving Grey Death Max withdrew from the field after their hovercraft, which had long since fled north. The Kurita Max made no attempt to follow. The two men faced one another, eye level with eye. Rebel and Legion members alike surrounded them. We barely escaped with our lives, Grayson said. Peter Dabrowski didn't make it at all, and it's your fault. After a long and grueling trek over little-used jungle trails, the strike force had returned to Fox Island to find that the commando forces remaining behind had been victorious. Two full companies of battle max, 24 machines, had raided the island, zeroing in on the small encampment that Grayson had ordered manned by a handful of volunteers. The lead Kureta max had blundered into the booby traps reset by Ramage's techs and the ordered battle formation had dissolved in chaos. Ramage's commandos had struck from the surrounding jungle, bringing down a phoenix hawk and a centurion and badly damaging three more light and medium mechs. The Kureta pilots, already nervous about operations this far into the jungle, had withdrawn. Overhead, the Slayer and Shilone had circled helplessly above the jungle canopy. Montido's rebel warrior recruits had ambushed the withdrawing enemy Max along the rim road as they were withdrawing from the island. They managed to claim a damaged stinger and a pair of commandos. Grayson's plan to destroy or cripple the fighters as they landed at their base below the university walls had succeeded as well, though at the cost of Dabrowski and his stinger. All in all, the day had gone heavily in favor of the rebel forces. Crowding near their leaders, no one could understand what had set off the confrontation. Tolan Brasadnewik scowled back at Grayson, his dark eyes locked with the younger man's gray ones. And it seems to me you're going too far telling us how to win the war. The council that hired you isn't around anymore. Why don't you people go back where you came from and leave us to settle our own affairs? Colin Dace stepped between the two men. Tolan, no. We'd never have made it this far without Captain Carlyle, and you know it. Do I? He laughed derisively. Do I indeed? We were doing all right on our own. Then he comes along. And what have we lost? The whole rebel council wiped out, and the dead, how many dead have we lost? Damn it, when the blues scattered at the airfield today, they left that gate wide open. With our two hundred boys we could have walked right in and taken the citadel. Only he says to pull out, pull out, with victory right in our faces. Grayson crossed his arms. Whether you like it or not, Colonel... We're in your war now. We've lost too many dead of our own to turn our backs on Verfundi, even if we could. But if we're going to fight together, we're going to have to pull together, with one leader. So it's come to that, eh? 
You think you're man enough to take me here? Toland spat out the final word as though it were an insult. It doesn't make any sense for the two of us to fight, Grayson said carefully. He and Brassadnewick were about the same height, but a rebel leader easily outweighed him by at least ten kilos. I suggest we use common sense instead. Enough talk! Brassadnewick had his fingers curled into massive fists now, his scowl transformed into a snarl. I had a chance to rescue Carlotta, and you botched it for me. Grayson's eyes widened. So he'd been right about Brassadnewick and Carlotta. They were lovers. Montido looked confused. But she was old family. Damn you, don't talk about her as if she's dead. Then, more quietly, So, she's old family. You think that mattered to us? Grayson watched something akin to embarrassment flick across the faces of some rebels. As for himself, he felt painfully out of place, as the witness to a very private family argument. The rift between the descendants of the planet's first settlers and the refugees who'd come later was old and deep. Feelings about men and women who crossed that line seemed to run high on both sides. Damn it! Brassadnewick shouted. Carlotta and I loved each other! His head swiveled from side to side, as though he were daring anyone to make an issue of the statement. And we still love each other! Nagumo's bastards haven't killed her yet, not if they think she might be useful for them, for propaganda or whatever. I would have had her out of there today, only, only... Tears choked him. Grayson put a hand on the rebel chief's shoulder. I think I know how you feel, he said. How the hell can you know that? This time there was no anger in his words, only pain and loss. You're not the only one who's lost someone he loves. Grayson spoke softly, remembering his father. But you can't use your people for your own personal vendetta. Not, and keep their respect. Brassadnewick just stood there, his eyes on the ground, fists clenched at his sides. Then, without another word, he turned his back on Grayson and strode from the group. Grayson started to call after him, but Montido held up his hand. Let him go, Captain. One of us will talk to him later. It'll be better that way. Dace nodded. Meanwhile, what are your orders, Captain? Later, in the dark and near chill of Verfundi's pre-dawn, Lori found a favorite rock among the trees beyond the plantation clearing. The Lee plantation lay at the top of the basin rim, amid a straggling jungle growth that had climbed the slopes from the Silver Basin and spread across the Blue Sword. Battlemax, their black shapes strange under the ragged cloaks of camouflage, they were among the jungle trees, loomed against a starry sky. Verfandi Alpha had long since set. The dream had come again, and she had decided to walk off some of the horror's edge. Listening to Chirimsim's keening and shrieking in the jungle basin below, she hugged herself and closed her eyes, willing the dream's terror to fade. She loved Grayson. She was certain of that now, but somehow, somewhere deep within, she could still not trust him. That conflict in her feelings for the young battle mech commander was tearing her apart. She had learned to override her own fears, even her terror of fire during battle, but she had not yet managed with the storm of her own emotions. She had been a mech warrior long enough to know that such a tearing of mind and will would sooner or later be fatal. The time would come when she would make a mistake, and... The dream had put her in a black mood. 
Would death be so unwelcome after all? Beyond the men and women of the Legion, she had no family. Certainly she had had no romantic relationships since her closeness with Grayson on Trelwen. Somehow, every man in the Legion knew she was the captain's woman. She laughed loud at that. The captain's woman. In the weeks since Sue Ellen's rescue, the two women had become friends. Recognizing each other's loneliness, they took comfort in one another. Laurie knew that Sue Ellen's loneliness was so much worse. Her man was dead. She opened her eyes, trying to shake off these thoughts of despair and death. In the darkness and pale starlight, it was difficult to make out who they were, but she could see a man and a woman approach the clearing from another path in the distance. It was some moments before she recognized one of the Verfandian women rescued weeks before. What was her name? Janice, was it? Walking beside her, the man had his arm around her waist. So, if Janice Taylor had found companionship among the men of the Grey Death Legion, why couldn't she? The man had both arms around the woman now. As Laurie watched him embrace, then kiss, her own loneliness became suddenly overwhelming. She wondered what Grayson was doing now. If he were awake, would he want her to come to him? The couple drew apart after a final kiss. Janice turned then and started across the clearing toward what was now the women's barracks on the Lee Plantation. When the man turned, Laurie finally saw his face clearly too. It was Grayson. He saw her at the same moment. He seemed to hesitate, then started towards her. She rose from her seat on the rock and turned to pass him. Lori. Good evening, Captain. At that moment, she felt more mixed up than ever. Was this betrayal that she was feeling? Was it jealousy? Or was it simple anger at her own confusion and distress? Lori, what is it? Nothing, Captain. Nothing at all. Good night. It was all she could manage to walk back toward the women's barracks without breaking into a run. The captain's woman indeed. Not many more weeks passed before it became clear that a second battle of Fox Island had been an important turning point in the war. Duke Hasid Rickel had departed for his starship, the Huntress, leaving Governor General Nagumo still in command. After all, Rickel admitted, the idea of attacking Fox Island had been his own, and Nagumo had deployed the two light recon lances with skill and dispatch during the desperate fighting outside the university walls. The rebels had been within meters of winning through the gates and into the university courtyard when the two lances and the sentry crusader had arrived and forced their withdrawal. The destruction of one of the rebel mechs was a decided plus, for the rebels would be hard-pressed to replace their battle mech losses. Rickle was more than willing to call the battle a victory and leave Nagumo in charge. His alternatives were either to place the incompetent Admiral Kodo in command, or to remain on Verfandi himself to take charge personally, neither of which the Red Duke was prepared to do. He was scheduled for an audience with Lord Kurita himself on Lufian in another two weeks. Besides, if he took command, he would have to produce a victory. At this point, Rickle wondered privately if victory were ever going to be possible on Verfandi. He had seen the faces of the people of Regis as they watched the passage of his entourage. The loyalists were grim and reserved, already fearful that their Kurita allies would depart, leaving them at the mercy of the rebels. Sheer, open hatred was on the faces of the rest. For the Combine, victory might well consist of escaping Verfandi with a whole skin. In the wake of the fiasco at Fox Island, 
patrols now departed less and less frequently from Regis or the other Kurita strongholds to sweep the countryside or probe the hills for rebel supply caches. The battle at the airfield had destroyed two aerospace fighters completely and the third would be crippled and useless for at least three months. The remaining fighters on Verfandi Alpha had been loaded aboard Rickles' dropship along with Dest 4. If it turned out that Nagumo would be unable to pacify Verfandi, at least those valuable units would not be lost. Of course, that meant Nagumo was left without their services in tracking rebels or providing air cover. The Kurita Max and the Regis Blues never entered the jungle anymore. To do so invited attack and annihilation. Within a few weeks, the Kurita presence on Verfandi had dwindled to Regis itself, a handful of mines in the southern desert, and a scattering of fire bases and supply depots guarding the principal, government routes of supply and communication. What was left of the 44th Line and the Light Recon Regiment remained within Regis itself, while the others were deployed in garrisons at the mines and elsewhere. At any given time, a quarter of the Kurita Max were down and under maintenance, their pilots on leave at a base on Verfandi Alpha. For the first time in nearly a decade, most of the countryside and smaller towns were not under the shadow of the Kurita Max. Nagumo dared not risk a major confrontation with the rebels, not with their numbers growing explosively every day, with rebel attacks growing fiercer and more daring with each incident. In one day alone, eight Verfundian Aztecs, five Regis Blues, and three Kurita soldiers had vanished in downward Regis in broad daylight. Their heads appeared later, artfully arranged on the steps of the university, and no one would admit having seen who left them. Nagumo may have won a victory at the walls of the university, but he was beginning to feel like a man with a noose around his neck. There were no more riots in the streets, but the air was charged as if by an approaching storm. In the countryside, Grayson and the Grey Death continued to work informally with rebel bands, taking the best recruits and training them in anti-mech commando tactics, then taking the best of those and training them to operate the growing army of captured Verfandian mechs. By this time, most of the old agromechs had been either destroyed in battle or been cannibalized for parts, but more than enough Kurita mechs had been captured to replace them. The ranks of the Free Verfandi Rangers conventional infantry had swelled so much and so fast that Grayson's most urgent problem was providing food, shelter and weapons for the mob of new recruits. Raids were mounted week by week, then day by day, to secure the food, ammunition, shelter kits, medical supplies, weapons and clothing for an army that numbered now in the tens of thousands. Very quickly, Grayson found that he could not begin to cope with the logistical nightmare by himself. He reorganized the army under local commanders, men and women, who had already learned what the Great Death had to teach and who had proven themselves in combat against the enemy. These commanders took their own units, organized as short battalions, to hiding places throughout the Sylvan Basin, while friendly plantation owners and farmers diverted most of the food tacked for delivery to Regis to the rebel camps. When questioned by the Regis Blues, the standing answer was, the rebels took it, I had no choice. In the end, Nagumo had over a hundred battle mechs and elements of eight separate infantry regiments tied to a score of towns, villages, cities, mines and transport sites, while the rebels held near absolute control over every other habitable part of the planet. The Governor General could not allow this state of affairs to continue much longer. Not if he wished to keep his head when the Red Duke returned. As the rebel raids continued, it became painfully clear to him that the rebels were drawing their supplies 
from one source only. The supply dumps established by Nagumo's own troops. Such depots were necessary if Nagumo's forces were to operate with any kind of freedom outside the walls of Regis, but they invited attack and were difficult to defend. After all, there were so many sites to protect, and only so many operational mechs at any given time. With that realization, Nagumo's eyes had widened, and his fist had come down on the palm of his other hand with a smack. The mercenaries were the key to the rebels' success. They always had been. Perhaps it was not too late to destroy the rebels by striking down the mercs. And if he could capture Grayson Carlyle himself. Nagumo was sure he had the answer now, and those supply dumps were going to be the key.